following breaking news overnight, police responded to two large shootings in different parts of the South Side. Yeah. As we dive deeper into this intricate web of territorial disputes and affiliations, we aim to shed light on the forces that have shaped Chicago's gang culture over the years. The war that infected the streets of Chicago, those of the infamous Oblock and Tukaville, lasted for years and took a large toll on the community. This widely known conflict has a deep history and it goes way back. Today we will research the history of events that unfolded prior to the gang war that escalated between two of Chicago's notoriously dangerous blocks, explore why and how conflict emerged, and pay Pay homage to all the victims and fallen warriors of this large-scale beef that went on for years. This is the story of Oblock and Tukaville, and their devastating war that forever changed the landscape of the city, our perception of gang life and in doing so, gave hip-hop an entire new genre. The history of Chicago's gangs starts in the late 1960s. The transformation of the Black Disciples and Gangster Disciples only reached its decline in the mid 2000s During this 40-year period, both gangs saw a significant shift in leadership. An important year that comes up often is that of 2004, when the crackdown on the Black Disciples took place, which led to the indictment of their leader at the time, Marvel Thompson, along with 41 other senior members. It started with a bang and a round of applause. All over Chicago, they're tearing down the cinder block dinosaurs known here simply as the Projects. They've been a disaster. Chicago's decision to demolish several large tenement buildings that had served as strongholds for drug dealing by both the Black Disciples and Gangster Disciples caused a major change. This demolition left many younger members of these gangs displaced, pushing them to seek new territories and form new alliances to sustain their street operations. During this video, we will focus on two of the most prominent Black Disciples and Gangster Disciples sets that emerged after the demolition of these Chicago projects. Specifically, we'll take a closer look at one of the most famous Black Disciples sets in history, Oblock. However, Oblock wasn't always known by this name. Long before King Von and Chief Keef immortalized Oblock in their lyrics, the Black Disciples controlled the Parkway Gardens blocks in Chicago, which were originally referred to as Wick City, with YC, standing for wild, insane, and crazy. Notably, the stylization of Wick with three I letters was influenced by the Black Disciples' association with the number three. It's worth mentioning that many of the young Black Disciples based at Parkway Gardens were descendants of Black Disciples who had worked under Marvel Thompson in the castle before the major bust in 2004. For context, it's important to note that the castle referred to a significant drug dealing operation run by the Black Disciples in Chicago during a time when the gang was much larger and had a more structured leadership. However, as we move into the 2010, the Black Disciples in Wick City became less organized and essentially transformed into an emerging Black Disciples set composed of younger members with ties to the original castle operation. Many gangs emerge as a means of protection against against rival groups. In the case of Wick City, their primary rivals are a couple of gangster disciple sets situated in neighboring blocks. One of these gangster disciple sets, known for their ongoing conflicts with Wick City, is the St. Lawrence Boys or STL. This particular crew is based on 63rd and St. Lawrence Street. This location is precisely why figures like King Von frequently diss individuals from the 63rd area. Well, we put in work from 64th and from 65th, we not from 63rd. We hang on 64th, 65th, and King Drive. And on 63rd, over here, kind of to the left, they dirty and stuff. They be up there just doing stealing and doing all type of petty stuff. So we don't go up there with them because they be dirty. I don't know, something ain't right up there. So I had to make it known, like, because it's so close, we not from 63rd. Furthermore, the STL GDs have affiliations with another adjacent gangster disciple crew known as EBT, located on 64th and South Eberhardt Avenue. This interconnected web of gang territories and affiliations plays a significant role in the dynamics and conflicts within the Chicago gang landscape. In the world of Chicago's gangs, it's common to hear names like STL and EBT mentioned together, often collectively referred to as STL EBT. This territory is situated right next to Parkway Gardens. Folks now shooting hey, niggas in new assholes. Let niggas be known. STL EBT right here, man. Shout out to the game, man. Hey, you know what that shit. Hey, you guys, man. You already know, man. Hey, what block I'm on, man? Hey, you on EBT, man. This is right here, man. It's challenging to pinpoint a single event that sparked the intense rivalry between these two groups. 
the reality is that some of this animosity dates back to their high school days when members from these areas engaged in typical schoolyard fights. However, these seemingly minor conflicts escalated into deadly violence once these individuals grew old enough to access firearms, possibly with older BDs and GDs from their respective areas fueling age-old feuds that may have roots dating back to the days of Marvel Thompson and even earlier. It's crucial to remember that many of the people involved in these stories are essentially children or teenagers with tragically short lives. This fact adds an extra layer of tragedy to the events that unfolded over just a few years. Now, turning our attention to Parkway Gardens, where the Wick City Black disciples BDs made their home, it gained notoriety as one of the most dangerous blocks in both Chicago and America. This reputation was primarily the result of an alarming surge in shootings that occurred between 2011 and 2014. I got a 10-1, police 10-1, 6330 South King, 6330, we got one more shot. Got another we got one more it's evident that Parkway Garden's reputation for danger was a direct consequence of the events that unfolded during this feud. Moreover, it owed much of its notoriety to the presence of highly dangerous individuals who occupied these blocks during that time. Some of the names associated with the Wick City BD enforcers of the 2010S may ring a bell, especially if you've listened to popular Chicago drill music in recent years. The most renowned figures from this era include Chief Keef and King Von. Chief Keef, hailing from Parkway Gardens, wholeheartedly represented O Block and another BD affiliated set known as 300 in his music. While Chief Keef cultivated a reputation for street toughness and trap music, he never claimed to be an assassin. His eventual focus on music development might have played a role in ensuring his survival. In contrast, King Vaughn, a Parkway Gardens veteran, was known for allegedly being involved in multiple homicides and openly acknowledging it in his music. Even in the early 2010s, King Vaughn proudly displayed his BD affiliation on social social media, representing Parkway, and expressing unwavering loyalty to his gang. Among the other notable figures in the Wick City BD set were feared individuals like HK and J Money, also known as J Mana. Additionally, there was King Von's close BD associate, T Roy, with their bond becoming increasingly significant as our story progresses. In fact, King Von used to go by the name V Roy on Twitter as a nod to their strong connection, and his Twitter handle still retains the reference Fram de Wick, signifying his origins in Wick City. Other Wick City members who held it down alongside King Von and T Roy included Big A, OD, Trey 5, Platoon, Boss Money, Sheroid, Duke, Ra Ra, aka Reezy, and Boss Top. Boss Top, like Chief Keef, transitioned into the world of rap and even released a song titled Wick City. However, he later had a falling out with Chief Keef after allegedly stealing clothing from him. These were the Wick City BDs fiercely defending their block, ready to confront their rivals with determination, frequently signaling their readiness with GDK hand signs, signaling their intent as GD killers who were unafraid to act. On the STL EBT side, they faced off against a few individuals who might be familiar to you if you're well-versed in Chicago's drill culture. Among these figures, one name that stands out is Gakira Barnes, known as K.I. or Key. She was a young female hitter and had a close friendship with fellow member Tuka since childhood. Another significant member was FBG Butta, who, alongside KI, formed a dynamic duo affectionately referred to as the Twins. Other members within STL, EBT, and the broader Flyboy gang included individuals who were more focused on making music. This group included names like FBG Brick and the legendary FBG Duck. Another musically inclined member repping FBG was Lil J, who lived in STL and later formed closer ties with them, although he primarily had disputes with the 600 gang that ran adjacent to this feud. Additionally, there were individuals like Little B and Wooski, the latter often dubbed King of the Ops. Boss Trell and Little Doc also had notable roles in this dynamic. It's worth noting that while this list covers prominent members from STL EBT during the mentioned period, there may have been additional figures in later years who aren't included here. So now that we've introduced the background and key individuals involved, let's delve into the actual storyline. This will provide us with a more in-depth understanding of how the events unfolded, ultimately leading to Wick City's transformation into O Block and STL EBT's evolution into Tukaville. While attempting to trace the origins of this feud back to its exact beginnings between BD and GD members from these blocks might seem somewhat unrealistic, but we can certainly pinpoint the commencement of the real violence between these groups to one crucial moment. That moment was the tragic killing of Edric Tyson Walker, also known as Ty, a BD member who fell victim to gunfire in May 2009. Ty was just 17 years old when he was fatally shot multiple times shortly before 10 p.m. on the 6,500 block of South Evans Avenue. Three suspects from EBT were charged with his murder. It's worth noting that Ty was more closely associated with another BD set known as 065 Young Money. However, 
Following his untimely death, local friends of his came together to form the group TIMB, which stands for, Ty, You're My Brother. This was both a way to honor his memory and a commitment to seek retribution, a trend that would gain momentum as this feud continued to escalate. Yet, Ty's tragic loss was only the beginning of the bloodshed in the area, primarily instigated by members of STLEBT. It was the subsequent killing, occurring after Ty's murder, that marked a direct escalation in the conflict between STLEBT and Wick City. In this case, the individual in question was Reezy, also known as Ra Ra, an older OG member of Wick City. Tragically, Ra Ra was gunned down in August 2010, further fueling the flames of this ongoing war. Reezy, also known as Ra Ra, whose real name was Laverick Marshall, held a respected position as an older OG member within Wick City. However, on August 25, 2010, tragedy struck when Reezy was discovered shot in the back after law enforcement intervened in a massive brawl near 64th Street and South King Drive. Regrettably, Reezy was later pronounced dead at the hospital. While there has been much speculation surrounding the identity of his assailants, no conclusive evidence has ever surfaced. Nevertheless, it's a fact that only a month later, another brutal homicide occurred, seemingly connected to these ongoing tensions. In this instance, the victim was Jeremy Marshall, also known on the streets as Little Four, and he happened to be a blood relative of STL member FBG Kells. Jeremy lost his life on their turf when he was approached near 63rd and Rhodes Avenue by two individuals. One of them brandished a firearm and opened fire, shooting Jeremy in the back as he attempted to flee before tragically succumbing to his injuries. The shooters hastily fled the scene in a vehicle. Once again, the identity of the perpetrators remained unclear. However, intense speculation suggested that the culprits might have been affiliated with the Wick City BDs. Some even went as far as connecting this incident to Odie Perry from Wick City, who had garnered a reputation as a shooter during this period. While this connection couldn't be definitively established, it's likely that retaliatory acts between Wick City and STLEBT unfolded in the months that followed. This sequence of events ultimately brings us to January 2011, where we encounter a name that would become all too familiar in the Chicago drill scene, Tuca. On January 12, 2011, a tragic incident occurred. 15-year-old Shundale Gregory, known on the streets as Tuca, was waiting at a bus stop on the 600 block of East 63rd Street. At a certain point, a dark-colored vehicle appeared, and an individual wearing a half-mask emerged from it. There have been reports that this person exchanged a few words with Tuca, but in a matter of seconds, they unleashed a barrage of gunfire upon him before swiftly fleeing the scene. FBG Duck, a member of STL, was actually close friends with Tuca. Upon learning of Tuca's death, Duck rushed to the crime scene, where he had the heartbreaking experience of seeing his fallen friend and brother before Tuca was taken away. This tragic event marked a significant moment in the ongoing feud between Wick City and STLEBT. Yeah, real close. Everyday okay. friend. Tuca tragically lost his life at the scene, with paramedics unable to save him. The responsibility for Tuca's death remains unclear, but it's essential to understand the context of this tragedy. Ty MB members were determined to avenge their friend Ty's death, targeting an STLEBT member. Conversely, Wick City members sought retribution for what had happened to Reezy. However, regardless of the motives, Tuca paid a heavy price for his affiliation with STLEBT. In response to this devastating loss, STLEBT decided to rename their neighborhood Tukaville in honor of Tuca and as a pledge to seek vengeance. Members like FBG Brick passionately upheld Tuca's memory. It's worth noting that in response to these events, members from TYMB and Wick City formed an alliance, anticipating retaliation from Tukaville. In the face of Tukaville's intense desire for revenge, a fervent desire to disrespect Tuca emerged from the BD side. As you may know, Tuca's name has been the subject of numerous disses in hip-hop over the years. Initially, GDS from Tukaville, including FBG Duck, claimed they were smoking Tuca out of respect for him. This claim was reminiscent of the old story about Tupac's crew, the outlaws, allegedly smoking his ashes in a blunt after his death. However, BD opponents from Wick City immediately turned the narrative around and started mocking Tukaville. Chief Keefe's Three Hunna track contained the iconic diss line, and this sentiment was echoed by other members. Beneath the surface of social media trash talk, a more sinister undercurrent existed. As mentioned briefly earlier, one of Tuka's closest childhood friends was a young girl named K.I., who gained notoriety as a teenage assassin, allegedly responsible for 17 homicides by the age of 17.
It is said that Tuca's death played a pivotal role in transforming K.I. into a cold-blooded killer, receiving guidance in shooting from her cousin, fellow Tukaville GD boss trail, and learning street maneuvers from her older brother Seaball. A vengeful teenage K.I. would ultimately find her opportunity for retaliation in the form of Odie. Yeah, I used, to be, I used to be with O.D., the, the person who they named O Block after. That's who I used to be with. O.D., me and O.D. them used to run around. Folks was really like that, I ain't gonna lie. O.D. had everybody scared. He used to be whooping their ass around that bitch. And I used to be fighting one of them type of shorties who was always fighting everybody. So me and him really like came together on some. We like, we alike type shit. So we got to hanging out. I was from the Kite Man building. He was from O Block. I got to spend the night at O.D. crib and shit, being at O Block. And that's how I was out there. He died in like 2011. That shit made everybody who they is right now to this day. A lot of things changed. People started doing different shit, like, a lot of people start shooting guns and shit. Around 11.35 p.m. on August 10th, 2011, a devastating event unfolded. A respected Wick City member, 20-year-old Odie Perry, fell victim to gunfire near Parkway Gardens on the 400 block of East 64th Street. OD suffered multiple gunshot wounds, including a fatal shot to the neck. He was pronounced dead at Stroger Hospital within an hour of the shooting. Just as Tuka's memory had prompted Wick City BDs to rename Parkway Gardens as O Block in his honor, they did the same for Odie Perry, committing to avenge his death. The likes of Chief Keefe and King Vaughn have immortalized O Block in their music, and it remains known as such today. The killing of Odie Perry was believed to be revenge for Tuka's murder, a sentiment seemingly reinforced by the fact that it occurred on Tuka's birthday. The identity of OD's killers remains unknown, but rumors began to circulate that this might have been the first act of the teenage Tukaville assassin K.I. Little J, among others, played a role in promoting these rumors. However, it's crucial to note that no one has been convicted of this crime, and there was no concrete evidence linking K.I. or Butter to O.D. Perry's killing. It wasn't until many years later that a Freedom of Information request revealed that the police had officially named K.I. and Boss Trell as subjects in the report. This followed an unnamed informant naming them as the shooters in 2016, years after their passing. Let's consider for a moment the reputation that K.I. had when she passed away as a 14-year-old girl from Tukaville, allegedly responsible for such a significant hit on an older and respected Wick City member. This narrative makes sense given the circumstances. Tukaville residents couldn't believe that a teenager had carried out such an act. Combine this with the belief that K.I. was heartbroken over Tuka's death and was determined to avenge him, and it becomes apparent why she would earn immense respect within the gang. Her alleged involvement in O.D. Perry's incident was further fueled by tweets in which she dissed O.D., echoing the way O-Block members had spoken about Tuca in the past. One astonishing detail from this story is the rumor that O.D. Perry had a large .357 or .44 Magnum, which he was known for flaunting. The story goes that K.I. took this gun away from his body after the hit, a rumor supported by the fact that she seemingly flexed an almost identical gun on social media in the years that followed, almost as a trophy. While the exact details of the situation may never be known for certain, K.I.'s alleged role in the event that solidified O-Block as O-Block undoubtedly contributed to her fearsome reputation. Following O'Day Perry's killing, a relentless cycle of tit-for-tat violence between O-Block and Tukaville ensued, lasting nearly two years. This bloodshed would have far-reaching consequences beyond just this feud, marking a dark chapter in the Chicago gang landscape. On October 19, 2011, a tragic incident unfolded involving Edward Riley, also known as Platoon from O-Block. He was walking with his girlfriend on 63rd and King Drive when two suspects approached them. They gunned him down just one block south, near 64th Street, closer to O-Block itself. After this act, the suspects proceeded further down the block, where they shot a 15-year-old in the head, who miraculously survived. Unfortunately, Platoon was not as fortunate and did not survive. In Platoon's memory, albeit briefly, people began to refer to the area as Toontown. However, the name O-Block ultimately persisted. Intense speculation has surrounded the details of what transpired and who was responsible for the hit on Platoon. Apparently, aside from Tukaville, a GD set called MOB also had a motive to target Platoon as part of a separate feud in which he was involved, particularly with 600, who were also BDs affiliated with O-Block. It has been suggested that there were two assailants involved that day, with one allegedly being Lil B from Tukaville and the other, Beans from MOB. Additionally, many have claimed that Wooski from Tukaville played a role in this incident. It's truly hard
heartbreaking that, following the loss of a beloved O Block member like Patoon, the pain would continue as they would soon face yet another tragedy. On February 12, 2012, at 6.47 p.m., Sheroid Liggins of O Block was found with a gunshot wound to the head on the 6,400 block of South King Drive, just outside Parkway Gardens. This incident further underscores why this area came to be known as one of the most dangerous blocks in America. Sheroid fought for his life in the hospital for approximately four days, but on February 20th, he was tragically pronounced dead at Stroger Hospital. No one was ever apprehended for this crime. However, K.I. strongly implied on Twitter that Bostrell from Tukaville was responsible. Some people on the internet delved into these tweets, suggesting that Bostrell had shot Sheroid from across the street, purportedly using a gun equipped with a red laser beam sight to enhance accuracy. This gun even appeared in Lil J and FBG Duck's music videos for the song Critical, which Chief Keef dissed. Combine this with Bostrell's apparent bragging about the incident on Twitter later in the year and KI's tweets referencing the red beam, and it becomes clear that this was a brazen attack that only fueled further violence between Oblock and Tukaville in the ensuing months. On April 28, 2012, around 9.30 p.m., Marlon Monroe, also known as Lil Doc from Tukaville, had finished a painting job and was walking towards a convenience store on the 6,300 block of St. Lawrence Avenue, a gunman passed by and unleashed a hail of bullets. Marlon stumbled away from the scene, injured, and eventually collapsed into a tall patch of weeds in an empty lot near the store. Shockingly, when the police later arrived, they didn't find Marlon's body. Instead, they collected the spent shells and evidence and left the scene, with a 16-year-old boy discovering Marlon hours later in the weeds with a gunshot wound to his chest. Marlon had been left there for over an hour after being shot, and within an hour of being discovered, he was pronounced dead at Stroger Hospital. Once again, it remained remains unclear exactly who was responsible for this crime. The next high-profile shooting between O Block and Tukaville featured a very familiar face, King Von. On October 13, 2012, a 17-year-old boy named Model McCambry was walking along the street with his cousin on their way to meet someone. This occurred on the 6,300 block of South Roads Avenue around 9.30 p.m. An assailant approached and opened fire hitting Model in the chest. Tragically, he later died at Stroger Hospital. What makes this story and the previous one even more heartbreaking is that Model and Lil Doc were actually related, sharing a grandmother who received the devastating news of both of their deaths within months. Many have suggested that King Von was responsible for Modell's death, primarily due to tweets he made to Tukaville op, Wooski, hinting at his involvement, or at least his crew's role in the incident. Von was even rumored to have been present for several shootings carried out by Oblock during this period, which contributed to his fearsome reputation as someone always willing to engage in criminal activities. Von famously claimed in his songs to have seven bodies to his name, although the veracity of that claim remains uncertain. Following these incidents, O-Block shooters continued their efforts to claim lives from Tukaville, perpetuating the cycle of violence. On October 30th, 2012, a man named Derek Johnson, also known as P5 or Crack, was tragically gunned down. He was not a member of Tukaville but belonged to Jaro City, a Chicago gang set located north of Tukaville with a history dating back several years. On that day, P5 found himself on Tukaville turf, specifically the 6,200 block of South Eberhard Avenue. Reportedly, members of O Block, including J Money, King Vaughn, and Big A, were lurking in the area looking for Tukaville rivals to target. Only a day prior to this incident, King Vaughn had tweeted about his intention to claim more lives to catch up with fellow block shooter T Roy. The story goes that these O Block shooters spotted P5 at around 9.13 in the morning and opened fire, hitting him multiple times. Some accounts even suggest that he was hit six times in the head and nine times in the body. P5 was rushed to Stroger Hospital but once again was pronounced dead within the hour. Following this incident, the intermittent violence between Oblock and Tukaville showed no signs of abating. Oblock continued to seek retribution for the attacks they had endured. Not long after the P5 incident, Oblock appeared to have claimed a high-profile member of Tukaville. 17-year-old Rodney Stewart, known as Boss Trell. Boss Trell, who had allegedly killed Sheroid from way across the street for Tukaville, seemed to be planning to leave town. He had tweeted about being excited for a fresh start on November 6th and had even purchased a bus ticket to depart on the 10th. However, only two days before his scheduled departure, on November 8th, Boss Trell was found face down in an alley in the 2600 block of West 83rd Street, having been shot in the back of the head. This location was significantly distant from both O Block and Tukaville. Some have suggested that J Money and T Roy were involved in a setup, potentially orchestrated by an allegedly disloyal ex girlfriend. They purportedly lured him far away from Tukaville with the promise of meeting a girl, only to shoot him when he arrived. Bostrell didn't pass away immediately, he was left fighting for his life. 
ultimately declared brain dead in the hospital after several days. T. Roy, widely believed to be responsible for this incident, mockingly tweeted on November 8, no trail, stay alive. Tocqueville affiliates like FBG Cash paid their respects to Boss Trail, and his death was a profound loss for Tocqueville. A song in tribute titled Dear Boss Trail hinted at his past as a red beam slinging shooter. Dear Boss Trail, you my broski and I miss you. On the other side, Oblock celebrated their perceived retribution for their fallen brother, Sheroid. However, Boss Trail's death would set the stage for a dramatic act of vengeance. On September 2, 2013, Jerome Wood, also known as J Money from Oblock, was allegedly set up in a manner eerily similar to how Boss Trail had been set up. J Money had apparently gone to a location on the 6,600 block of South Rhodes Avenue around 2 p.m., seemingly under the pretense of meeting a woman he knew. However, upon arrival, he was met by Lil B and K.I. from Tukaville. He reportedly tried to escape by running down a gangway into an adjacent property, but tragically he was shot in the head and collapsed outdoors, ultimately succumbing to his injuries. Tweets from other gang members suggested that this incident was a direct act of retaliation for P5, Boss Trail, and other previous conflicts. After this incident, K.I. tweeted about shooting people in the back of the head, leading many to speculate her direct involvement in this particular incident. Ironically, within a year, another Tukaville member, Lil B, who had supposedly been present on the day of J Money shooting, was killed by the Chicago PD on March 28, 2014. He was reportedly chased by the police, who had observed a suspected drug deal. The police claimed that Lil B hopped over a fence and pointed a pistol at them, which led them to use a taser and shoot him multiple times, resulting in his death. Following Lil B's death, Patoon's cousin publicly stated that they had found the individuals responsible for his cousin's death, with one person being charged with an unrelated murder, referring to the other mob member allegedly involved, and the other being killed by the police, referring to Lil B. Many took this as confirmation of Lil B's involvement in the Patoon incident. Following these events, Tukaville and Oblock continued their ongoing conflict for years to come. However, the dynamics would evolve. Notably, King Von was incarcerated for approximately three and a half years after being charged with the murder of another Tukaville affiliate, Malcolm Stuckey, a charge he later beat. During this period, K.I., fueled by her thirst for revenge, formed Taekwon World after the loss of another young friend, Taekwon. She engaged in various street feuds beyond Oblock, confronting rivals from different parts of the city. Eventually, her past would catch up to her. Furthermore, the prominent Oblock member, T-Roy, would be tragically slain, leading to the remaining members forming a get-back gang with a single-minded mission to seek vengeance against Tukaville and other groups they believed were involved in the loss of T-Roy. As we conclude our journey through the turbulent history of Oblock and Tukaville, it's essential to reflect on the lessons we can draw from this tale of violence, loss, and revenge. This narrative is a stark reminder of the devastating consequences of senseless killings and the toll it takes on communities. In the heart of Chicago, these neighborhoods have witnessed a cycle of bloodshed that has left families shattered and communities torn apart. The stories we've explored serve as a poignant reminder that the pursuit of vengeance only perpetuates a never-ending cycle of violence. But it doesn't have to be this way. We must come together as a community, as a society, and recognize that the path to a brighter future begins with a commitment to peace, unity, and understanding. We must strive to break the cycle of violence that has plagued our neighborhoods for far too long. Let us remember the lives lost, the families forever scarred, and the communities yearning for healing. It is in our hands to make a difference, to create a safer, more hopeful environment for the generations to come.